Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three free or pay what you want adventures for the OSR. Now, they're each for specific systems, but they're easy enough to adapt that I don't think that's a big problem. But I think each of them is pretty tonally unique. It, it, it's pretty particular. These aren't all going to fit with any table or any campaign. I think you could run them all as one-shots and everyone would have a good time with all of them. But they're, if you're going to take them and adapt them or use them in your game of choice, or your campaign or something like that, they're each going to be pretty specific. So I don't think they're all going to appeal to everybody. But I think they're all cool and they're all certainly worth looking at. And because they're all free or pay what you want, you know, if you if you look at the one you want, you really like it, it's pay what you want, throw some throw some money at it, <laughs> right? Uh, but, the, but two of these are just straight up free. Um, the first one I'm going to be looking at is the Black Apple Brew. This is for basic fantasy. This is by Kyle Hedinger or Hedinger. Now this one is free. I'll put a link below to where you can get it. It's a fantastic fairy tale-esque adventure. Very, very much in the tone of something like Dolmenwood or the adventures I've been reviewing recently, fairy tale adventures. Really great, whimsical, little darkness, but less on the dark side and more on the whimsy side. I really like this one. Got a lot, it's more of a setting. There's a, there's a you play a few sessions here in this, uh, in this particular adventure. So the Black Apple Brew will be the first one I look at. The second one is going to be Falling Skies. This is for ICRPG. If you know ICRPG, then you'll know it's much more narratively heavy, and it's much more about creating that sort of dramatic moment where the players kind of make these, these decisions or there are the sort of dramatic tensions that are being raised scene by scene almost, right? Or room by room, depending on how you do it. And this is no different. That the, the sort of, well, as you'll see as I go through it, there are sort of questions that are raised by the writers you know, will the players be able to do this? This is the dramatic moment of this particular scene. It's not just like, hey, you're, here's an area and go an adventure. It's like, no, this is an adventure. And there are sort of steps that you're going to take through it. It's much more focused, much more, not, I wouldn't say railroady, but it's much more, um, you know, this choice than that choice. Okay, after you've made that choice, this choice or that choice, that sort of thing, right? So uh, it's a narrative tree branching structure, I would say. But it's really cool, and it's got a sci-fi fantasy thing that a lot of people don't like, some people love. So we'll talk about that. This one is Pay What You Want on DriveThruRPG. And then the last one I'm going to be looking at is The Curse of the Ganshogger, which is system neutral. I think it's for Errant, which is the... This is by Gus L. or the uh, or by Killjester. And Errant is that system that I think is... is uh, well, anyway, I think it's for that system. But it's pretty system neutral. I haven't looked at Errant, so I'm not sure, but... Most of the rules are, are OSR generic, so they're pretty easy to swap between. This one is the most specific. I Well, Falling Skies and this one are both, they both assume a very particular world. And it's a world that not most people play in, or most tables don't play in. So this one will probably, if you want, don't want to run it as a one-shot, you want to adapt it to your ongoing campaign, it would take the most, I think, well, Falling Skies and this one would both take a lot of work. But I think this is a great one-shot or great inspiration for the beginning of a campaign. This is also free, and I'll link to it below. Let's start with the Black Apple Brew, which is, I would say, the most... <clears throat> it, it's sort of the most uh, typical in a lot of its assumptions, but it is fairy tale, and it does deal with that sort of side of, 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 the, of the hobby. Um, much more, you know, Susan Collins or Susanna... Susanna Clark, that's something about Susan Collins. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Susanna Clark, um, you know, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell rather than Tolkien. Because there's elves you're dealing with, but they're fairy elves. Yeah, Susanna Clark. Um, so the idea here is you have a village called Black Apple, and the children have been swapped out with changelings. Now, what's interesting is that the, the changelings are these ibex, is what they're called. They're basically goat people. And that would fit right into Dolmenwood. Instead of being ibex, you'd be the Oh, I forget what they're called in Dolmenwood, but one of the playable races, or the playable species, is goat people. So you could easily swap them out, and there would be no, no problem there. The brew elves, as they're called in here, you could just make them elves. Or you could make them fairies, or something like that. And the, the fairy lord is just a fairy lord, the elf lord. You just run him as a fairy lord who's been exiled and has his own location here. But anyway, these people, uh, they long ago, they used to cut down all the trees of the forest, and then they were cursed by the forest because it didn't like that. And then a druid or something came and talked to the to a squirrel, and the squirrel explained the situation. And so the people the people stopped cutting down the trees, and they started raising pigs instead. And then they lived in harmony with the forest for a while until they were so prosperous that an elf lord was just jealous, and he's like, "You're mine now." And so he just asserted dominance over the village. 
took their children in a sort of fit of petulance and replaced them with his own minions just to cause trouble and, and laugh at them, basically. Very fey, um, you know, whimsy but dark in that way. So the overall adventure, I would say, is kind of discovering what's happened with these children and getting them back. That's kind of the overall, you know, quest. Although there isn't a specific quest given. Um, but that's the idea. So the, the village is detailed and the surrounding region is detailed. And one of the things that I really like about it is that the random encounters are all pretty cool. Things like a poison poet <laughs> or uh, a werebore, who's a particular person, or the goblins. The goblins are great. I love these sort of fairy tale goblins. One of the ones you can run into. These goblins are trying their hand at petty racketeering. In the name of Lord Gizgik the Just, the leader will ask for one gold piece per person in back taxes. If the party refuses to be shaken down, the goblins will fight if they think they can win. Otherwise, they'll retreat into the woods with curses and threats of legal action. The largest goblin carries a small pouch with 14 gold pieces and wears a handsome blue officer's jacket, bedecked with medals of participation and not getting killed first class, worth one silver piece. <laughs> right, so that sort of tone. That's what you're going to get throughout. I love that. I mean, it's, a, it's good to see it right away. Some of the encounters are more ordinary, ogres, boars, owlbears. But one of the things is if you printed this out, you have little checkboxes for each hit point for each of the creatures as you go through. So you can keep track of them right there. That's kind of cool. I like that. Visually see how many hit points they are, they have and how many are left. Uh, the idea, again, is that these children have gone missing and been replaced, and the replacements are acting up. They're, like, causing trouble. They're burning down houses. They're stealing from people. They're pranking people and laughing at them. They're just, you know, one of them shouted something scandalous in the middle of church, and so everyone's shocked. And, like, people are realizing the kids are starting to misbehave, but they don't really know why. Like, really badly misbehave. And so one of them has been sent to the sanitarium, this doctor who's convinced that it's, well, he knows it's probably Faye, but he's talking about possession and exorcism. He wants to do brain surgery. It's kind of crazy. Um, Arthur Figwart. And Figwart, that's the sort of name, like Prigwart is the name of one of the towns in Dolmenwood. So Figwart fits right in with that, the, the naming conventions. The tone and the, the sort of world that's assumed is very close to Dolmenwood, sort of high medieval with the church playing a, a significant role saints that you pray to, um, maybe traveling clerics, a so close association of elves and humans, but, you know, maybe a healthy separation between them. So it's, it's very clearly a, you know, a, a um, Dolmenwood-like world. Uh, so the, the region is pretty cool. You have a few things that you're running into. There's a sort of fey tavern in the forest called the Hen's Teeth Tavern, and that's pretty cool. There's some interesting clientele, fawns, who are raucous and crazy. There is a Periwinkle Black, who is a female brew elf, who can show you completely on accident, or not, not intentionally show you a way into the, the brew itself, which is the place where the elf king lives. There's a Shrine of Confession with a giant owl who demands that you confess. You pass through the, the stone and confess your sins, and if you don't, he tries to attack you and eat you. There's a tenpenny wood with a treant and sturges and glowwood trees, which are very valuable. Now, what's really interesting about this whole thing is that with just a little bit of work, you could make this very, very specific to a setting, especially something like Dolmenwood. For example, the Shrine of Confession, you know, um, there are these standing stones, and it would be fairly easy to come up with a connection to the Fae and for this giant and why it's a place of confession as opposed to just a... It'd be easy to, to add it into the world a little bit. This doesn't explain the origin of some of these things. They're just there, but they're cool. There's the village itself, the law and order of the village and the people you can run into. And they're all very flavorful and engaging. You've got Tobler the taxidermist or Tobler the taxidermist, Agatha the apothecary, uh, patrolling clerics of St. Ludden, a pig running loose, a cottage on fire, Alistair the treasure hunter, Sir Rupric the wary. They're two uh, potential adventurers you could hire. There's the wicked children you could run into. So the town is engaging and it's sort of fun. You're going to run into you're going to run into some some hijinks, but it's going to probably be hijinks that you like. Whoa, these kids are really bad, and that might draw you in. There are some adventure hooks as well that can connect you to the characters, or connect you to the world a little bit. In like, hey, the, you know, you're the nephew or one, you're the uncle of one of these misbehaving children, so you've come to help them uh, because their parents are desperate for their help. <laughs> there are some rumors, and a lot of them are just straight false. You know, I don't like these so much, but they're in the context of village gossip, and that's fine. That's the sort of thing you're going to get, right? A lot of fake things, maybe some truth mixed in. So players know going into it that this is, you know, they should take this stuff with a grain of salt. Um, see, again, that sort of thing is not really helpful to me because 
you know, adventure uh, rumors that are taken with a grain of salt. Players are either going to ignore them or they're going to take them seriously. Either way, it's going to be a problem. They take the false ones seriously. They're going to be, you know, unhappy about it. If they take the true ones. They dismiss them. Then they're going to be unhappy about that. Um, so I like again making a distinction between the true and the false rumors, and making clear that false rumors come from people who the players should know better than to trust, and the true rumors come from people that perhaps they actually should trust in the context. So I, you know, I think it's important to do that rather than just be like roll randomly for the gossip that they hear from this person. You know, I think it's better to do it that way. You don't want the players to be totally like, what's the point of the rumor if it has zero impact on their decision making, right? There are some guards in town, and there's Agatha the Alchemist, or uh, the Apothecary. She makes some bedtime tea, berserker juice, love potion number eight, uh, right rain, possum powder, lich guard. Great stuff, it's technically not magical, but it's close to being magical. Then you have Goodall's Fine Trading. Um, to lots of different places. The Jolly Fox Inn, and the entertainment there, you can get into basically a fight club, and uh, all that sort of side stuff going on there. And there's also, like, extra mini side quests going around, right? There's Lumberjacks Against the Forest Monsters. That would probably involve that, uh, that glade at some point and the, um, the glowwood trees and the tree ants and the sturges. There might be the, you know, menial labor tasks they could do. There's a bunch of wild dogs that are being led by a kind of, like, fey dog, a blink dog, basically, something like that. And it's going around and harassing the village and attacking the pigs and stuff like that. Um, there's an escaped lunatic. There are particular monsters that are going around killing. The the adventuring party that was here recently was just devastated by owlbears, so you could go out and kill them and get vengeance for the dead adventurers. Um, there's a lot of stuff like that. Really cool. It's a solid starting place to have a campaign, just a short, you know, a few session adventure or something like that, whatever it might be. There's enough here to go on. Oh yeah, there's Pigman Jack, who has recently just become a werebore. Kind of interesting. The Chapel of St. Ludden. And a St. Ludden's Priory, and then Tobler's Knickknacks, and Taxidermy with a bunch of zombies. Uh, zombie chickens, zombie raccoons, zombie boars. <laughs> it's pretty great. And he buys corpses, so you go and kill big owl bears, you can bring it back to him, and maybe he'll make a taxidermized owl bear, owl bear. Hey, maybe this is close to the Waking of Willoughby Hall, where you can then have one of Tobler's creations. Uh, then there's a cemetery, and that's where the kids are digging up bodies to rob them. That's terrifying, but also pretty funny. Um, and then the parents of the wicked children, and then there's the Fay Hill, or the Fail, pronounced the Fail by the locals. The Fay Hill is an earthen mound on Black Apple's northern edge. So it's a, a place, it's the way to get into the brew, but you can't get into it by digging. If you try, bad stuff happens. Um, you're cursed, and cursed in very bad ways. So you have to make it clear there's a leper in town, and he's a leper because he tried to dig into it. That should be made apparent to the PCs right away. There are some fairy ruins, uh, Figwort Manor, and they're the Figworts of the people who run the town, sort of. They're the Lord and Lady, and it's their son who is primarily acting up, and they're kind of the ones who will pay you to find their, their child. There are others in town that might give you something, but they're all pretty poor. These are the people who have wealth, and they'll be willing to pay you to bring back their son, or to figure out what's wrong with them and kind of go forward from there. It, you know, because at the beginning, no one really knows what's happening. Maybe the guy at the sanitarium does, but most people just think the children are strangely acting up. I'm sure they'll connect it to the fairy curse. And in fact, one of them, the children, the, uh, the, the daughter of Lord and Lady Figward is Wilda. She knows what's going on. She saw the mirror that they used to converse. They summoned the fairy lord by saying this creepy rhyme, and he appeared in the, the mirror and drew them into it after him and then sent his transformed minions out in their place. And uh, there's two mirrors that you can use to enter the place, one in the Figwort Manor and one in the uh, the Hen's Teeth Inn outside, in the forest. Then you get the brew itself, which is the dungeon. And the dungeon is really cool. It's not, it's not a fighting dungeon. I mean, you do have fights throughout, and you're certainly probably going to end up fighting everybody. But you don't have to go in guns blazing, so to speak. You can actually go in and talk, and you have there's a whole thing where you can have dinner with the Lord, and if you behave well and he rolls high on his reaction table to it, then he doesn't kill you or try to kill you or throw one of you into the pit to be eaten by a giant worm. He's just, you know, much more condescending, and uh, he doesn't speak to you directly, except he speaks via his translator. He always speaks in Elvish, in his old Elvish. And his translator is this crazy jester, Moth and Water, who refers to himself in the third person, who's always translating. Um, he juggles 
sharp objects. He likes to, that's how he likes to show off. Um, he can do invisibility at will and confusion once per day, so he's pretty strong. He's also got a ring of fire resistance. That's worth that's worth something. And then where the the children are, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them, and they are all split up throughout this entire place. So if you're going to find them all, all the missing children, you kind of have to go through the whole thing, which is cool. Uh, they they have a magical golden thread tied around their ankle. That's how they're they're trapped here. So very fairy tale, very in in flavor. Now one thing I think is interesting about this, but it does create a bit of a a bit of a I wouldn't say a problem, but it's maybe a little laborious. Is that when you first enter the brew, you have to make a save versus spells in order to see through the illusion of the place because it's been enchanted to look like this great court with very well dressed people, perfumed smells marbles and rugs and ivory and just gold and stuff. I mean, it looks great. But it's all an illusion. In fact, it's just a hovel. It's just a cave system, you know, with <laughs> dirt mounds and, and, you know, wood and kind of shabby things. It's not great. So so there's a disconnect there. And that's cool because when the PCs finally see through it, they might go, oh man, this, that's kind of an interesting moment. But it happens right away when you go in. And every PC has to make it. So anybody who fails sees the place as... Anyone who fails sees it as grand, and anyone who succeeds for the whole time simply sees it as uh, shabby. That means you really have to read every description twice. You have to read the, the nice one and the shabby one, and they're all written out. You won't have to read them, you know, word for word. But it does mean that there's a lot of like, okay, you guys see this, but you see that. You see that, but you see that. And that could be funny. I think there'd be a lot of you, you read the grand description first, and then you read the false. But I think I might, I would probably do it differently. I think I would have everybody see the grand one, and then at some points throughout the adventure, they can roll to see through it, rather than just have it be right away. That way there's a sort of disillusionment as you go through the adventure, you know, PC by PC, they start to see the place as it really is. And maybe you don't tell them which is which. You just say, you start to see it this way, and maybe they're like, oh, which is real, right? That would be, now you could do it, other, you could do it either way. You could do it either way where, you know, Maybe you make the saves your, on your own side. You know, maybe you hide them. And so that way they, they don't know if they've succeeded or failed and which one is which. Whether it's actually shabby or actually rich. But anyway, I think there's some fun stuff you could do with that. The idea itself is great. I just think this execution of it means that it's going to be just sort of like... It's kind of rote and I think there's more opportunity to do fun things with it. So I would, yeah, I would probably change it just to that. Like have, again, set times or maybe at certain rooms or when certain things happen. Everybody gets a chance to save again or something like that. And maybe those who initially succeeded are overcome by the illusion and they start to see it again. You know, things like that. Uh, because, again, what if, if everybody saves, then some of the humor of this place will disappear. Because I think some of the humor is besides, specifically um, the contrast between what you think you see and what's actually there. So if everybody succeeds or everybody fails right away, you're not going to get some of that humor and that tone won't be quite the same. But what's going on in the dungeon is great. There are there's a game room with elves who really don't like losing, and so if you beat them, they turn on you and start to attack you. Uh, there is a ballroom with a bunch of elves that are all dancing, lords and ladies, and it turns out that it's just a bunch of animals like donkeys and cows and horses and pigs. It's really funny, and they're not intelligent. They're just animals, or at least as far as I can tell, they're just animals. But it sounds like a party with music and beautiful dancing <laughs> and, and smells beautiful, and then you know, it turns out you're basically just in a, in a barnyard. Um, the library is hilarious. There's this huge library, and it's just full of these grand books. And it turns out it's just the the minute by minute life of this one dude, who's a charcoal burner who died 20 years. Like he's just an obscure nobody, but it's his entire life written out. Indeed, the entire library. It's volumes one through what is that? Three thousand three hundred and fifty nine. I think that's right. M M M C C C L I X. Yeah, three thousand three hundred and fifty nine. I think. Uh, that's hilarious. I love that. So it's just this huge library of useless books. Well, they're worth like eight silver pieces if you bring the entire collection back to the family uh, who, who is the guy up. But one of them, the volume, the final volume, 3,359th, yeah, exactly. 3,359th volume in the series is the one you have to look for to open the secret passage down to level three. You have to click that. So either the players could think about that and be like, oh, well, let's look for the last one. Or someone could tell them, right? Because there's a lot of characters they can interact with here. Uh, there are There's a field full of um, mushrooms, and uh, they're being tended to. It's a blue house instead of a green house. And in the middle of it, there is a uh, 
a gazebo. And in the middle of the gazebo is this white lady. You know, she's an elegant lady sitting on a plush armchair, long black hair, an elegant white silk gown, pearl necklace, rose petals litter the ground around her feet. She reaches out a hand, you know, for you to kiss her. Turns out it's a ghoul, so if you have the illusion, then it's just, it's a ghoul. It's going to attack you. But that would be a good moment uh, where this, this very, if you haven't saved, this beautiful woman just starts paralyzing you and devouring you. And you're like, what is going on? But those of you who have saved know that it's a ghoul trying to eat you. Uh, there are some really interesting things here. The ambassador of the mushroom people is here. He's a mushroom man. He's peace-loving and will only fight if attacked. And he cannot communicate. <laughs> he just can't communicate. Communicate. That's it. Um, there's a prince among frogs. This one's another cool moment, but it's another one of those moments that might be frustrating for some of the players because the way it works is it's a frog who can talk, and he says, I'm a prince, and I have to be kissed by a fair maiden, or if there's no fair maiden available, a plain maiden or a man, whatever. He's not picky, but he's actually just a frog. And uh, if you kiss him, he's a poison frog, and so if you kiss him, you'll be racked by pain for the next 12 hours, and it says the person in this state is completely incapacitated and for the duration is useless for adventure. That's a little rough for me, for kind of a joke. I would probably either give them a lot of indication that this frog is lying, so that way if someone really wants to do it, it's clear, or um, make the effect sillier rather than just you're incapacitated and useless for 12 hours. Because if you're playing a party, say, of four people, every person's controlling one character, you're going through this dungeon, you, you're trying to rescue the kids, and then this one kid, one, one person's just out for 12 hours. That'd be kind of frustrating. You'd be like, great, what am I supposed to do now? So I probably wouldn't do that. I'd probably make it some silly effect. Maybe they turn into a frog for like an hour, right? <laughs> like the frog princess, or the princess and the frog, whatever that Disney one movie is. Um, he, I love it though. If he, if that happens, he apologizes profusely and claims that kiss must be required. It must require true love. That must be the difference. That's why it didn't work. <laughs> He's got one hit point. He's just an ordinary frog. He's got a, a dainty miniature gold crown. There's the ballroom with the cats, dogs, donkey, elk, weasels, goose, and goats. There's the musician station, the dining hall, and this is where you have your different course meal, four course meal, where deviled quailed eggs with black apple ham, lobster bisque, Waldorf salad, and then your choice of cockatrice au poire or black pudding. I think that's how you say poire, I don't know. Um, or black pudding. And it's actually just a black pudding. You, it tastes like chicken, the cockatrice, but it, you have this turn, you can, you can be turned to stone. <laughs> and the black pudding is just literally a black pudding. And the elves are just doing this for fun. They, they have their own food, which it looks like it, but it's different and they just want to see what happens to you. At the end of the meal, if everything's gone well, then you just get to go about your business, send to the guest room, so the elf lord goes away. Or they throw an ibex down to the pit just to, like, you know, you can some entertainment for the guests. But if they've been, you know, bad, or <laughs> if they have been uh, disrespectful, then he probably is just going to throw them down into the pit, or try to. You might just fight them all here. There's seven brew elves, two ibex, um, and the king, perhaps, and his... Uh, his steward. So it could be a tough fight if they're all there and the players are just, you know, suddenly surrounded by them. So they probably will end up getting thrown down into the pit. Uh, there's a, a dumb waiter with stuff going in here. There's a smoking room, a servant's quarters. There's a pool of love and drowning where two sea elf maidens are swimming and then they motion for you to join. It's actually just giant frogs. They're actually not maidens. There's the pit with the tentacle worm. There's a cold storage with an ice devil who's been tricked here. That could be a useful um, creature to make a deal with, kind of, you know, uh, or at least to be like, hey, you don't want to be here. I can free you. Don't kill me. Go kill the elves. You, know, you could try to do it, try to get to do that or something. There's a kitchen where there's a, an actually just a cook, a human cook who likes the job. <laughs> She's not been enchanted or anything like that. She's just, she likes working for the elf king. Uh, wine cellars, a moth in water's chamber, and uh, the elf lord's chamber. There's a dungeon, and the dungeon is hilarious. Really funny. There's a Ned, who is a horse. So at dinner, the elf lord will keep talking about this guy, Ned, who he hates, Master Ned. He just hates him. It turns out it's his war horse who insulted him or looked at him the wrong way, and so he puts him in the dungeon, and he's just down there. There's this giant, there's a war horse in the dungeon. But it looks like a unicorn in a beautiful field if it's not, if you haven't solved the intent. Otherwise, it's a, it's a, you know, <laughs> a horrible torture room. And then there's the treasure vault with... Lots of lots of gold, lots of valuables, and cursed magic items, which makes perfect sense. If you're going to be a fae lord and you're going to break into a fae lord's vault, you're going to find magic, but it's all going to be cursed. There's a wand of moss oaks, which raises the dead, but they're all insane. A moss oak, I think that's a reference to um, 
Is that not a reference to Jonathan Strange and Mr. Normal? I think it is. The Moss Oak. Then there's the Rod of the Centipede, which just turns into a centipede to attack you, and the Gloves of Naughtiness and Sauciness. Really good to really good for thieves. Plus twenty percent to pick locks or open lo uh, pick pockets, but you have to say impolite truths, blurting them out at, at bad times. And then there are magic mirrors, the two fun things that you might expect. You know, te teleporting you to random places, taking you back to places in the world, creating devils of yourself that you have to fight. All that stuff. Now at the back, there's a few new monsters, just a few, and a map of the region, and uh, the, yeah, the dungeon maps. And I like the dungeon maps; they're actually pretty cool. They're fairly straightforward in that there's not a lot of looping going on here. There's not a lot of, it seems to me, choice between like, okay, I'm going to go here or there. Initially there is, but after that it's kind of like once you've gone into a region of a particular portion of it, you're going to kind of go down there. Um, but that's fine. Totally, totally okay. And it's not, it's pretty open. So it, and it's not huge. So it's not a huge deal to me that it's not like super looped or something like that. It's, it's great. It's fun. And that's the whole thing. So that's the Black Apple Brew. Highly recommended. Highly recommended. This one's the longest by far. This is 49 pages for the PDF. And again, it's free. So I'll put the link below to where you can get it. Highly recommend. I think it's super cool. The tone is great. Just what I like. The second one, as I said, is called Falling Skies. This is only 14 pages. So it's a lot shorter. This is for ICRPG 2nd Edition. This is by D&D Spree or RPG Spree. Um, this is Pay What You Want. So I'll put the link to where you can get it. Um, now, this is a really interesting one. The art's cool. And the, uh, the design of it's really interesting. Essentially, you have these kind of tribes up in a, in a cold region, and or maybe it's like maybe an ice age is beginning or something like that. Bad, you're, you're members of a tribe, and the cold is getting worse and worse and worse, and it's unclear how much longer your tribe will be able to survive. And then this falling star crashes into the world, and the people of the village, the elders of the village, have a vision that there's a girl in that star and she has to be saved, sleeping inside cracked glass. So this is what I mean by, you know, this is certainly sci-fi mixed in with the fantasy here. Um, what are you gonna do? We have to go save her because she can help us, and that's the idea. So you have to save her before she dies and she's trapped in this cracked glass. So you have some choices about where to start. The players can choose where they start, which is an interesting way with a dramatic question. And that's one of the things you see throughout. There's kind of like a description and then a dramatic question for that place. So if they pick the Wretched Pits of Tar as their place to hunt, uh, then you have a description of the place. A young mammoth calls frantically neck deep in tar. Its mother is unable to help without risking her own life. The rest of the herd moves on. A young mammoth's miserable cries, cries begin to attract predators. Dramatic question. Ten dire wolves approach. Can these mongrels be distracted long enough to claim the prey? So it, things like that. The eroded altar. The stranger paints blood on the altar of black glass, chanting and waving a bundle of crow feathers in his left fist. He appears well fed. Dramatic question. Could this stranger know where to find food? Why is he alone? Could this be a trap? And the secret is he has seen a vision, a girl riding flames who does not burn. He waits for her here. Interesting, right? Dramatic questions, but not a lot given. This is going to be a lot on you to develop. And that's how ICRPG is, right? Hank for now doesn't... He doesn't... Well, he assumes that you know how to play the game. He assumes uh, a lot of you. Not, and I don't mean that by too much. He doesn't assume too much. He assumes that you are competent as a GM and that you can come up. And I think this is designed in that mind. This is designed for ICRPG. This isn't by Hanker and Fernell, obviously. This isn't by Runehammer. But it's designed in that mindset, for that mindset. Here's a bunch of stuff. Here's some cool ideas and some places to take the story. But as you can see, it's very much like a branching, kind of like once you do this, then you'll have this thing happen. And then there's a shock wave, and this will happen. And then if you decide to go up days later, you'll have this sort of thing happen. And then you'll descend down into the cavern, and then this sort of thing will happen. And then you get to the, the dungeon itself, sort of, and here's what's going on there. And now, one thing here is that there's a crew that's trying to save her, and you show up, and it's like, can you help them find the tools? And I'm like, well, the crew would know where the tools are. You don't need to help them. That's, that's a little strange to me. So what I would say is just the crew's dead, right? And it's just her. And maybe there's a communication, or like an AI, right, report something. Now, of course, there's a creature here. There is an insectoid that has gotten loose. It's what caused the crash in the first place. Maybe it killed. Maybe there's a, someone who's like torn apart and dying, and they tell you, you need to find this, you know, and they can speak with a translator, you know, like a universal translator or something like that. Anyway, it's a very simple little dungeon, but I love that isometric view. You can get the whole thing at a glance, really, where you're going, and it's it's interesting. I like the I like it, the way it's laid out. It's it's not looped at all. I might add a loop through the... Or maybe it is. Maybe you could climb up over the... Uh, plants into that platform. I might do something like that on the left from four to five. 
rather than having to go one, three, seven, five. In fact, maybe I would just put a ladder there as well and allow you to climb up. But there are multiple ways to go through this dungeon. You can certainly go through the main hatch into one. You can climb up around the side to four, maybe break in through a broken window into two or something like that. Anyway, there's stuff going on here. Things are malfunctioning, but you're going to have to kind of come up with what the particular problem is here. Right, so what's going on in the crossway entrance? What's going on in the command center and AI inter interface? What's going on in the cryo capsules? And there's ideas here, but something is lurking here in the cryo capsules. And then what happens if you save her? And uh, what might happen? Maybe she'll take you, maybe the, if you save her and save the ship, then she'll fly you to somewhere else. Or maybe uh, she'll fly you to her planet. And maybe on the way back, you know, something happens. While aboard the ship, a band of reptoid cruisers encircle the ship with the intent to claim the vessel and its occupants for the reptoid empire. This would be a way to continue on into a either warp shell uh, campaign, which is the sort of sci-fi ICRPG campaign, or going into a much more, um, you know, sword and sorcery game with that sci-fi element in it, <laughs> something like that. There's the alien stowaway, uh, given in the ICRPG stats, but you could easily make this super creepy if you wanted snatching hunger pinchers its weaknesses. That's awesome. One of its weaknesses is cold, and everything outside is freezing. So that's kind of a cool thing if you can open it up. Like, there's a lot of cool ideas in, in this. There's some other creatures too, a horned walker and a terror bird. And then some artifacts and loot that you can get. There's an insulated parka, a blowtorch, pain tablets, a dried, dried spices, a huntsman's whistle, and a skull whacker. Very clearly different uh, influences. So Falling Sky is very small, but super cool. And I think you could have a really interesting beginning to a campaign with this. Uh, if you just take it as inspiration, take the ideas on a list and start to build out from them, you could have a few sessions where the players are really feeling the cold. You say, okay, we're going to play this kind of campaign. And then there's this event that happens and then they go find the ship and that could be a whole adventure there. And you could start a whole campaign off that way, either by going into sci-fi or by staying in the more sword and sorcery, um, you know, uh, old school pulpy jungle or they take them to a desert or a savanna or a temperate zone and then it becomes more you know they have to deal with all the problems there and you're kind of dealing with a tribal and trying to protect your tribe and whatever it might be so anyway falling skies by uh the uh by rpg spree or dnd spree really cool really cool and i highly recommend you guys check it out again it's pay what you want so if you do end up using it i'd say you know give it some money because this is definitely this is definitely worth it the last one i'm going to look at is curse of the ganshauger which is the weirdest in a way, of the three. Uh, it's only nine pages. Or it's nine uh, two-page spreads. Uh, because that's the the one that I have here. So it's it's OSR. But the idea is you're dealing with geese. There's a goose king. <laughs> so that's not going to fit every campaign. You could change that to an elf king or a human king. It doesn't have to be a goose. But a lot of the flavor here, instead of house carls, it's goss carls, right? A lot of the flavor is going to be lost if you just switch this to a regular campaign of humans and elves and dwarves and halflings. The, the idea that it's a the, the main villain, the Ganshagar, is a uh, is a swan thing, right? It's a it's a it's a swan monster, basically. Um, the Signet Rebels. It's really interesting. It's a really cool campaign. You you start off in the Hall of the Goose King, where you're told that you have to go defeat this this. Uh, Creature, the great gander of the clay marshes, has come again. The Ganshagar's scream. It's a gander, I guess. It's not. A, it's not. A, it's not a swan. It's a gander. Uh, but the idea is, you have been hired to go deal with it because it's you know the, the, it's not it's not the sort of thing the king does, right? <laughs> he's he's not that sort of person here. He's not that sort of beast. He, he lets you deal with it. Uh, and you go to the clay marshes, and it's basically just a, a point crawl through the clay marshes, which is the area around the tomb and then the approach to the tomb itself. And there are some really interesting stuff that you can encounter along the way. The farm, where you run into these dead adventurers, they don't appear, they're not dead at first, or they don't seem dead at first, but they'll feed you, and if you eat what they're feeding you, it turns out you're eating people, or what's left of them. If you just go ahead with it, you get a blessing and a curse, but you're also a cannibal. That's pretty dark, and a lot of people are not going to like that, but I think it would it's the sort of campaign you're looking at here. There is a bell in the place, and one of the ways of defeating this creature is by sounding a bell, because the creature itself is really, really, really strong, the Ganshogger. One of the ways to defeat it is by 
clanging a bell, and there's a bell here, and there's a ruined chapel without a bell, and so you can put two and two together, or maybe there you can find other ways to put the bell there. Maybe there is, actually, now that I look at it, is there a... I actually don't know if there is a bell in the shrine. Yes, there is. The tarnished silver bell is in the shrine. So there are a couple places where you could find that bell. Um, yeah. Uh, farmers are not what they seem. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, the, be the bell theft here, actually, I'm reading through it again. I'm being reminded. It's not that they have a bell. It's if they have the bell, or if they have a bell, then it's stolen from them here. And if they don't have a bell, they can find one at the shrine. Then you have the Ganshogger itself, and you can see it's got 100 hit points for an OSR game that's really strong. Right? Really, really strong. And its abilities are incredible. It's got, it generates 10 hit points per turn. Um, it just, it's, it's got a lot of damage. This is a really strong creature. Like, you're just probably not going to be able to kill it, usually, in its just one-on-one -on -one form, if you just go to one-on-one with, one -on -one with it, unless you're really high level. But it has a lot of weaknesses. And the weaknesses are as follows. There's bells. So a loudly ringing shrine bell prevents the Kenshocker from regenerating and will cause it to receive damage as an individual instead of as a warband, which is um, some of the rules specifically, I think, for Errant. I'm not sure exactly what that means, not knowing Errant too well, but it wouldn't be too hard to adapt that. Right? It takes more damage, or it's it's suddenly it's um, resistant, or it's not resistant, or it's vulnerable to certain kinds of damage. You can make it that way. And then it has nine crowns. And if you remove its crowns, it reduces regeneration, threat, and hit points by one. Uh, and you can steal them. Now, if you give it a crown, or if you offer it a shiny object, it must give you a crown. Each object must be different. Only four crowns can ruin this way. So there's like a, a rule there, right? You can steal the crowns, <laughs> but it gets free attacks. However, if you do get the crown, then you have weakened it significantly. Here's the map of the King's How, which is where the Ganshogger rests. It's a really cool isometric map with a few ways through, lots of loops. This is a very, very old school, I would say OSR um, style dungeon. Lots of loops, lots of ideas, lots of interesting things room to room with a very easy read. You could, you could read through this for the first time while you're running it. Maybe give yourself 30 seconds as the players are talking about what to do to read the next room or the next couple rooms. And you could run this without having prepared it ahead of time. Real, I, that's definitely my preference for adventure design. Now, I've been going through a lot of the more <laughs> more classic adventure design where you just have paragraphs of text. That's not what you get here. You get short paragraphs, bolding, italics, um, and just, again, very short descriptions of the rooms. It sort of, if you're going to do a lot of flavor of what the room looks like, it's going to be up to you to develop a lot of that. There's a lot of treasure here, seems to me. You can get a lot of treasure, some magic items here. Um, but it's a cool dungeon, and it would involve cleverness, not... Not like, you know, you got to be... It's not a puzzle dungeon by any hand, by any means. But it's cool, and there are stuff that's happening, and there's a lot of cool, like, tricks in the different rooms. Like, for example, in room four, the enameled altar. Warmly lit by six wrist-thick candles in wax-shrouded blacks set in a blackened silver candle holders. 400 platinum, one quarter slot each. On the altar is a feather blade, or 400 pence. I don't know. P, I assume that's platinum, but I don't know. Um... On the altar is a feather blade, and any sword placed on the altar will transform into a feather blade in one travel turn. Opening the altar cabinet reveals a three-foot square door. Beneath is a shaft that leads to the concealed hatch in the roof of the Tomb of the Conqueror below, Area 6. Feather blade is a divine feather, zero slots, the length of a short sword. Magic, medium weapon, but falls apart after one battle. Attack rolls with a feather blade. Feather blade cannot be impaired. Not sure exactly, again, that sounds errant specific, but it's, you know, it's a, it's, plus to hit, or it uh, it can't, you know, it, it ignores resistances, or you can't have disadvantage while attacking with it, right? something like that. And then there's the Undercrypts, where you have the Thralls of the Ganshogger. Random encounters, uh, the local area, local effects, things that can happen through there, the Ghost King that you can run into, the Tomb of the Conqueror, with a lot of cool stuff down here too, porcelain statues, uh, which, uh, there's a Strigiform Colossus, the Strigiform, I love that, Strigiform Colossus. Sounds pretty tough. The Tree of Woe, which is, uh, I think that's a reference to Conan the Barbarian. The Ghost Maze down below, and then the Lair of the Ganshogger itself. Now, there, one of the things you can do is get a crown down here, the Crown of the Signets. And the players might say, hey, what if we give the crown to the Ganshogger? Right? What if that's what we do? Because it's wearing a bunch of crowns, what if we give it a new one? 
And it said, well, you can. If the crown is given to the Ganshogger, it will transform into a giant black swan beast possessed by Rara's spirit that will seize the throne within weeks. Rara will make a worse king than Sigtrig the second, replacing military adventurism with sadistic revelry and an unquenchable desire for revenge against goose kind. So he turns into the last signet king, the last swan king. Really cool. Really cool. The clay marshes. Great little... It's not even a point crawl, really, right? It's just a region um, that you can go through. That's the whole thing. So... Curse of the Ganshogger, excellent, but very tonally specific, right? Most people aren't playing games where there are goose people. But if you did, it'd be great. And I think you could throw this into something like um, Dragonbane really easily. Just make it a mallard instead of a goose, right? <laughs> or, or have it be a goose anyway. And there's also goose people and mallards and all that. So this would be easy in a game like that. But really, again, the ideas here are awesome. The design is great. And the art's really flavorful and engaging and Tonally specific, but I like the tone. So Curse of the Ganshogger, Falling Skies, and the Black Apple Brew. Highly recommend all three. And again, I'll put links below to where you can get them all. All right, guys, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you in another video.